Coming in at number 30, Phil Plantier. I fly ball deep left field. That ball's way back. Home run. Plantier going the other way, a long way from home plate. It's only fitting that the player filling the lowest numerical spot on our list also has the lowest stance. Plantier's exaggerated crouch almost seems too strange to be real, but it was. And it didn't stop him from slugging 91 home runs over eight seasons in the majors. He was also fortunate enough to work with the legendary Ted Williams while playing in the Red Sox minor league system. Perhaps he picked up a trick or two from Teddy Ballgame, who just happens to be the next player on our countdown. Did anybody have, and we never, we know none of us are live, but did anybody ever have a better batting stance than Ted Williams? Passo pitches, Williams swings, there's a high drive going deep, deep. It is a home run. That anytime you're in the batter's box, in a relaxed position, in a ready position, in a striding position, in a swinging position, everything should be in balance. Ted has that way, you know, he's sitting there kind of the restless, sort of ready to do, and then that beautiful swing of his, and then boom, you know, out of the park, or the double to the wall, you know, whatever it is. But as far as batting stances are concerned, you're not gonna be a baseball genius to look at his and say, ah, that's how I want my kid who bats left-handed. That's the batting stance I want him to emulate. From old school to new school, next up on our list is 2020 World Series champion, Cody Bellinger. When I first saw Cody come into the league, it's a unique batting stance, very erect, and he has that way of, see where he's looking straight at the pitcher, a unique batting approach. You know, I think as a kid, as long as everyone, I don't remember like working on my swing, I would just like go in the cage and just try to hit the ball, you know. I, mean, I didn't even work on it in high school, really. I was just going out there and swinging, so. <laughs> Um, I don't know, I just always picked up a bat and that's what felt most comfortable. Well, the hips go first and the shoulders and the hands stay back and that creates that torque through the midsection and that launches the bat. Just, I don't know man, just like the comfortability of it is just way more comfortable to me. Um, getting bad habits when it's over here and just not completely natural to me and I've always been, you know, wiggling, wiggling it this way so. Just try to get back to that and still making adjustments. Coming in at number 27, it's another Boston Red Sox legend, Carl Yastrzemski. Carl Yastrzemski, without a doubt. In fact, I used that all through high school, all through the minor leagues, and up until uh, my first full season in the major leagues, up until the All-Star break. That was my memory oh, sure. of Carl, yeah. Yeah. how high he used to hold the bat. I mean, touch of the sky. Yeah, that was very early in his career. That was actually the 67 year, the Impossible Dream Team. Yeah. I mean, he was way up here with the bat. Listen, whether you hit right-handed or left-handed, kids my age, 55 and above, probably 60, they all emulated Yaskrimski. With the bat high, everybody that I knew growing up playing Little League Baseball emulated the great Yaz. One of the most universally beloved players of the century, Prince Fielder made his money via the long ball. Fielder lays into one. Deep right center field. Prince Fielder! A walk-off winner! I just remember, like, just a stocky guy. He was on the, on the plate um, and just, like, had a little bit of waggle, and it was very simple. And I, the thing that stands out to me is, like, the finish. Like, he did the – it was like a lean-back finish is, is what stood out to me. Now, there's a fan here who is dressed like Ichiro, oh acting goodness. like him almost to oh my God, exact point. He's watched him once or twice before. You can tell he's done this before. The most unique batting stance I saw, and it was an honor and a privilege to play with this guy, was Ichiro Suzuki. The man would come up there, he would slide, he would slap the ball all over the place, and he would drive it deep if he needed to. It was amazing to hear a guy with that many hits over the course of his career talk about he's always trying to find ways to improve and had to work on it. So anyone out there watching, even the best hitters in this game are always trying to find ways to get better. Everybody's different. I mean, if you could say, you look at Ichiro's stance, and go, okay, time out, pal. This is not the way you hit in the big leagues. Maybe this works for you in Japan, but this is not the way you stand, right? Fortunately, no one said that to Ichiro. And, you know, this improbable stance gave him the remarkable Hall of Fame career that he's had. Coming in at number 24, the Sultan of SWAT, Babe Ruth. 
There it is. It's going, going, it's gone. The greatest home run hitter of all time, Babe Ruth, was a magical name. Well, he stood in the back of the box, very upright, and uh, with his feet pretty close together, and he kind of leaned over just a little bit, you know, and he had this tremendous swing. If he'd miss, he'd pretty much turn completely around him. He had great wrists, but he would step in as you'd make the pitch. He tried to time his stepping in and stepping into the ball. From the great Bambino to the childish Bambino, Juan Soto is up next on our list. And Juan Soto has just gone deep, and the Nationals take the lead 3-2 in the fifth. What Soto does really well is he maintains his head position, much like a Tony Gwynn, so he can handle the strike zone very well. Doesn't have a lot of movement. Many times you see a lot of guys with leg kicks, big weight transfers. It's pretty simple. While his nickname and raw power evoke comparisons to Babe Ruth, their batting stances couldn't be more different. The most peculiar stance, barring maybe Stan Lopata, that I have ever seen, but it worked. The human corkscrew. Musial applied without all the theor theoretical underpinnings that Ted Williams had, the same principle, hips, hands, feet, torque, drive from the hip. He had a very unique batting stance. He would coil up coil up almost like a like a cobra would and then spring out of his stance and, and, and hit line drives all over the field. It was a whole body uh, assault on the ball and on the pitcher and um, it sure started ugly and it finished pretty. Up next on our countdown it's the late great Joe Morgan. Nellie Fox and I worked together my first year in the major leagues. He was a player coach for the Houston Astros and I would hit a lot of fly, fly balls to the warning track. So we needed to get the ball out of the air. We wanted to stop hitting fly balls. So we wanted to remind myself to remove my elbow from my side. So I would do this and it would just automatically go to the right place. And uh, then when I did it in the game, I got three hits the first time I did it. So the reason was to get the ball out of the air. The Joe Morgan batting stance is the elbow. I mean, that's uh, the flapping of the elbow for Joe is what's the signature element of his batting stance. You know, that close to him, Flapping the elbow there. That is the signature aspect of that left-handed hitter number eight. Joe with the flat. Boom. Coming in at number 20, number two, Derek Jeter. Base hit to right field. Here comes Richardson. Here's the throw for Marquez. Richardson is safe. Derek Jeter ends his final game with a walk-off single. Derek Jeter, where fantasy becomes reality. Did you have any doubt? I think how high he held the bat, I think how consistent he was in his stance. You know, that was the one thing about Derek. Derek never really changed. Um, he kept with that and he stood tall um, and he was a lot bigger than I think people understood. You know, when you think about a shortstop, I mean, he was six three and, and you know, he was over 200 pounds. So, you know, the consistency um, in standing tall is what was intimidating. His swing and his stance, the word that always comes to me, primal. Hunter Pence with a two-run shot and a three-to-nothing first inning lead in game one. It's all about how you finish, but it's amazing how some guy can pull off a hitting stance like that. Nothing I do is really conventional, but I find a way to get it done. Uh, but it was, it was based off of a Barry Bonds poster ad as a kid. And as I grew up, it just became comfortable, so I just stayed there. And I was really small when I was younger, and so it was cool for the leadoff hitter to choke up. No one really changed that. And then I grew up and got a little bigger, and I just kept choking up. You know, sometimes one of the, a couple of the coaches would be like, you're 6'4", you need to get on the end of the bat and, you know, drive the ball. And I'm like, well, you know, this is how I've always hit, and I, I feel like I drive the ball all right. Coming in at number 18, Moises Alou. Swung on. professional hitter. The man can just flat out hit. Uh, he loves the game of baseball. Uh, he goes out there and plays the game the right way. And uh, he's just a great guy to have on a team because uh, he can hit and enjoys the game. A professional hitter indeed. While Alou's stance doesn't scream power hitter, looks can be deceiving. Alou launched 332 homers over his 17-year career and earned his spot on our countdown. 
Coming in at number 17, it's Mickey Tettleton. Well, I'll tell you what, Dave Henderson not going to get this one. Boy, Tettleton put it almost on the roof. Wow. How about Mickey Tettleton? Switch hitting, power hitting catcher of a generation or so ago. From either side of the plate, he held the bat down low, the knob of the bat just about at belt level, and the top of the bat concealed behind his back shoulder. You could barely see the top of it before he unleashed his swing, but it worked. He had some big ears. Campbell, a notorious low ball hitter. Hits that high in the air to deep right center. To the wall they go looking, it's gone. But one swing of the bat and you're tied at two. One of the biggest things that stood out about the stance was that big throw that he had. I wish I could grow my hair that long because that made it amazing. But when you take a deep look at his stance, he was deep into his legs and used that as a good foundation to let the rest of the swing work. If you think of a house, the foundation is the key. You can have all the amazing things up top, the windows, the roof, everything, but if that foundation isn't strong, that house is gonna fall and collapse. The same thing with the swing. He was deep into his legs, he had a nice strong base, which allowed the swing to work. You know, he used to love Rod Carew's batting stance because his bat was never way behind him. He kind of kept it out there, you know, like, you know, sort of not too far back with his shoulder, which allowed him to slap the ball around really, really well. Well, you know, when I was in that in, in, in that stance, after I had perfected it, uh, I knew that I couldn't stand straight up, so I immediately got down in my stance, and it allowed me to stay on the ball a lot better. It allowed me to stop chasing balls up in the zone that I know that I knew that I couldn't handle. So it forced me to really, you know, stay in a low low position and uh, just force the pitchers to bring the ball down. So once they start bringing fastballs down, you know, I was able to handle those pitches with, with a lot more ease. Most unique and crazy batting stance I've ever seen, Kevin Euclid. You remember that one, bro, where he'd hold like on the top of the bat and then he'd slowly like inch his way down to the, to the handle of the bat? I never knew how he did that, but that was his timing mechanism. Listen, you had a tremendous career, and if that's what it took for him to be successful, then that's exactly what he did. So I would definitely say one of the more unique batting stances in the game, the Craig Councils of the world for sure, but somebody I played against, Kevin Euclid, no doubt about it. It's different. Yeah, I mean, you kind of look at it and go, how did you think of that? <laughs> you know? Uh, he has that type of batting stance. I mean, he has the bat over his head. He's pulling the head of the barrel of the bat right at the pitcher, and the next thing you know, his hands drop, and he's hitting the ball. And it just shows you you can do almost anything before you hit the ball. But you get in that good hitting position, and when that pitch comes, you know, you're going to be able to do a lot of damage if you do it. Number 13, Giancarlo Stanton. Stanton drives it, left field, absolutely crushed, and out of Dodger Stadium. You don't see that every night. It's home runs like this that make Giancarlo Stanton such a terrifying batter to face every time he steps in the box. He, he takes up the whole box visually when you're facing him. And I've faced him a number of times, and he reminds me a lot. I remember having the same feeling when Frank Thomas was in the box. He just takes up the whole box, and you don't feel like there's much much place to go with him. Thankfully, I throw a pitch that moves a lot of different directions, so I've, I've been able to have a little bit of success against him, but he is a very intimidating player to play against. Coming in at number 12, Albert Pujols. With a nickname like The Machine, it's not hard to see why Albert Pujols is ranked among the most intimidating hitters of all time. Swing it along one, there it is, baby. The Cardinals take the lead as Albert Pujols comes through in the pit. And the Redbirds lead this, baby, five to four. When this future Hall of Famer steps into the box, his power weighs in the minds of even the greatest pitchers. He's just kind of sitting there, kind of bouncing. You know, he has a slight little rhythm bounce to it. And so you just feel like he kind of has your timing of what you're about to throw. And he's got that bat speed to catch up to anything. So it's not a fun at bat to, uh, to face him with. Coming in at number 11, the player most famous for being himself, Manny Ramirez. What I remember about his stance is I never wanted to see it when there was a big uh, run to be driven in. That's what I remember the most. Off the bat of Ramirez, a leap and it's gone. A two-homer inning for Boston, and they've doubled their lead. It's 4 nothing. You know, Manny was a guy with a late kick that was very controlled. His balance was, was outstanding. Well, Manny used to do the little... 
<laughs> that little thing right there, I don't know how he did, but he just looked like he was about to go deep every yeah. time. Fly ball, deep drive to left field, and it's gone right now. Out of here, home run, Manny Ramirez. Uh, he was an intimidating hitter, and whenever you could pitch around him, you did. Coming in at number 10, it's Big Poppy, David Ortiz. Hard hit into right, back at the wall, tie game! Big Poppy, the grand slam! Uh, the leg kick, like the leg kick where he, I mean, just a big, big burly man, and um, same thing, close to the dish. Uh, felt like you couldn't go in when you're catching. Can't feel like you can't go in, but his leg kick in his hands. He had a little bit of a little bit of a little load with his hands, and, and uh, man, could he hit a fastball. What I like about him is how he's prior to the swing, he's got this little rhythm. He's he's already down there going. He's getting the feeling, and uh, like he told, he said about me, he gets the foot down early, and he also has a little. When he goes up with the leg, he, he also get his hands going, and that's what I do too, and we didn't talk about oh, that earlier. watching me, huh? <laughs> a lot. Up next is number nine, Mo Vaughn. High fly ball, deep to right field, forget that one. That is way, way out of there. Where will it come down? Off the scoreboard, above the ball strike counts, an enormous home run by Mo Vaughn. The man they call Hit Dog was an animal in the batter's box. And who better to hear from than the man himself, Mo breaks down what makes his stance work. My staff came come from the hitman Mike Easter, he's a bad coach in St. Louis. He basically taught me that if I got out, because I played in Fenway Park, and if I stood flat-footed without even striding and just rocked back, use my hands, but I could hit the ball off the wall anytime I want. What is high off the wall, and Mo Vaughn will check in with a double. And then we started getting into some more action. That's when I started getting lower and getting my head on the same plane playing the ball. That's why I get there like that, because I want my head on the same plane as the ball. Coming in at number eight, it's the legendary Gary Sheffield. Gary Sheffield with his 500th career home run. I think of Gary Sheffield, you know, how he winds up that front leg and he gets that bat almost turned towards the pitcher. You know, it's amazing he hits the ball as consistently as he does when he has so much going on with all parts of his body. What happened was messing around in practice one day and I started moving the bat. And I wound up hitting, I think, like eight to ten balls out of out of park in a row. And a home run to left field by Gary Sheffield, his first home run in the major leagues and his first hit as a big leaguer. And then Sheffield, you get that really? little wiffle ball bat and you try to swing that thing as hard as you can or as quick as you can, that was fun. I took it into the game. I was in Helena, Montana my rookie year. And I wound up hitting two home runs in that game and I never changed it since. Coming in at number seven, Barry Bonds. There may not be a hitter in baseball that pitchers feared more than Barry Bonds. Swing and a long one to deep right field. He may have retired over a decade ago, but an image of Bonds waving his bat around in the batter's box can still strike fear into the hearts of opposing pitchers. He was so quiet in the box, and just seemed like, you know, the ball, you know, he just had forever to react to it, or it seemed like it seemed that way. Uh, not a lot of wasted movement. He, he was a guy who was on the dish. You know, he had that big elbow guard where it was like, okay, you can't really pitch him inside because if you throw it out over the dish, he's going to spin your cap a couple times. So, you know, he was definitely a, a guy who was intimidating. Standing slightly crouched in the box, Bonds would stare out to the pitcher's mound, his head unmoving. He'd twitch his bat back and forth in an iconic motion before uncoiling his body into a swing that was equal parts beautiful and terrifying. Number six on our list, the man of steel himself, Ricky Henderson. And he gets a high fly ball to left field, and that one is carrying, and back goes Mitchell, and it's a launching pad again tonight. Ricky Henderson was only 5'10", but he exaggerated that with a purpose, getting into an extreme crouch which helped him to more than 2,000 career walks, which paved the way for many of his more than 1,400 career steals. Out of all the batting stances we've seen so far, there might not be one that matches its owner better than Ricky Henderson's does. As a player known for doing things his own way, it only makes sense that Ricky's stance is one of a kind. Ricky was his own guy. And when he stood in the box, 
his own way and ran to first base his own way. I mean, that, that's who he was. It was it was a real, genuine Ricky Henderson. You know, it, it's just the way I play the game, man. You know, I have some style in, in the way I go out there and perform. I think if I'm going out there doing an excellent job, you know, I enjoy uh, performing and, and, and using my style of play. Coming in at number five, Julio Franco. Basically, like you see him standing with the bat over his head and not waggling the bat, that was my stance. I just saw myself, so I always uh, look, looked at that guy as the guy. Franco's stance incorporates the most interesting parts of two other stances on our list, Moises Alou and Kevin Euclid. Franco stood awkwardly with his knees pointed inward like Alou, but held the bat high above his head and pointed straight towards the pitcher like Euclid. It was a bit like a Franken stance, or rather, a Franco stance. And good Lord, I hope my sons don't imitate it because uh, they'll strike out in every Little League game they play in. But only Julio could do it. I think it's proof again. Sometimes we try to make players into robots. Everybody should swing the same. Everybody should throw the same. You know, the good Lord gave people like Julio Franco special gifts. And fortunately, he didn't listen to anybody and hit the way he was supposed to hit and had a great career. Coming in at number four in our countdown is Jeff Bagwell. You know, I, people always joke about that I messed up an entire generation of kids in, in Houston, which I agree because I remember my daughters, they really didn't see me play, but you know, they see pictures of me. So when I started softball, they, the first thing they did is spread out and bend their knees. And I was like, oh my God, what's going on here? Well, I think about it, and he'll probably tell you the same thing. How the heck did he hit in that crowd? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, you know, he stepped backwards with his back foot. That's, you can't teach that. You know, you're supposed to step forward with your front foot, not lead with the back foot in baseball. See, everybody's comfortable in different positions. You know, you got to take your time to find it. He stuck with it and hit a lot of bombs. I know that. There's a drive back into left field. It is up. It is gone. Holy Toledo Bagwell bags another one. Whoa, was that a poke? It was basically my attempt to get my head to stay still the entire way. And I kind of learned that by watching Tony Gwynn. And that was the idea. Nor did I think that my legs were going to be that wide and I was going to drop my hands and step backwards. Everything I would never teach. Craig Council, hey, don't knock it. Strange as it looked, he was twice a World Series hero. On the other hand, I don't see any of his current Milwaukee Brewers emulating their manager's stance. My batting stance came real, it came from getting released. I, I got released by the Dodgers. I was not getting any hits. I couldn't square up the baseball, and I was just trying to find a way to hit a ball hard. Back into the corner. This ball is gone. Three run home run council. It's so different. You know, there's little things about everyone that you can kind of pick up on, um, but councils was just so. It was so different, it sticks out. I don't, I look at it right now and I don't, I don't understand what I was trying to accomplish, <laughs> but, but it worked. And, uh, you know, it got me some hits and it got me back going and it frankly got my career back going. So you, you got to go with it. The number two batting stance of all time, Tony Batista. Uh, Batista <laughs> with Toronto, man. That's the, I thought mine was bad, but uh, I, he got me beat. I would imagine there would be a number of people that their, their first thought would be Tony Batista because when you, when you see him, when the pitcher's starting his windup, you think he's not even ready. You take a look at his setup position, that wide open stance, numbers and letters on his chest square up to the pitcher, but his first move is a more traditional kind of setup. The thing with Tony, though, was cool is when he started to do his upper body back this way, it was really only his feet that were out of whack. And then his stride went into home plate, so he was about normal when he would square something yeah. up. Quite often, he is right near the back of the line. Sometimes you might even think outside the batter's box. And anybody that teaches you how to hit will tell you you got to have your hands above the strike zone and just swing down. And I don't understand how can he have a bat here and then get ready and, and hit down on the baseball. There's a drive, and this game is over. Tony Batista's second home run of the day. I don't know if I've ever seen someone <laughs> look straight at the pitcher like this, and then he's coming in like this, and then just hitting ball straight up. It was so great. That's my favorite stance. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, the number one batting stance of all time. And Ken Griffey Jr. will start the inning with his third attempt at hitting a home run in eight straight games. A high drive to right. This ball is gone! It's iconic, it's intimidating. If the word cool had a batting stance, 
this would be it. His hitting was uh, really phenomenal. Uh, to be able to go up there, if you go back and look at Ken Griffey Jr.'s first at bat to Ken Griffey Jr.'s last at bat, it's the exact same stance. You know, I, the first thing that comes to mind is to think of uh, Ken Griffey Jr.'s immaculate swing. Just the, that sort of pulling it out as if, oh yeah, the most logical thing is for that ball to be out of this park. Oh, <laughs> holy cow. That may have hit the warehouse, and they announce it did. <laughs> At some point in every baseball fan's life, they've stepped into the box, turned their hat backwards, and wiggled their bat just like number 24. It's got to be Griffey, right? I mean, didn't every kid, well, at least my age, every kid growing up in the backyard playing, playing wiffle ball was doing Ken Griffey. And to see him uh, get into a groove like none other, it seemed like every time he would come to plate in the kingdom, that he was going to hit a home run out. That's just the presence that he had. Now Griffey unloads to deep right. The game is over. This has to be one of the most dramatic wins the Mariners have had here in the kingdom. From the iconic bat wiggle to the smoothest follow through of all time, the kid's dance is as close to perfection as you can get.